like I told you, I'm not a change management guy. I just observe change management. And that's as far as I dip my toes in the water. But I've seen some really, really interesting ideas. And like I said at the beginning, maybe some of you might have missed it. You weren't here yet. Um, but the best change management I've seen is any change management. Anything. Anything. You know your users better than we do. Um, there is not one size fits all. But what I would argue is the more effort you put into it, the more dividends you're going to pay. And when a customer says, hey, take a look at our change management plan. What do you think? I go, it's great. You didn't even read it. I know. It's great. It's freaking great. It's going to work. Are you measuring their satisfaction? Yeah. Great. It's going to work great. You know, honestly. Um, so here's some basic constructs. Um, your, your CSMs, the CSU, should be aware of a few of these slides because I pull it out of their master monster deck. It's like amazing. And there's a lot of really, really good stuff in here. And it's like it scares me out of the water because it's so complicated. I'm like, um, I just pulled out a couple of slides here. And it's really this. Like, look, the best change management plan is an organized one. You know, um, leadership support super important. The messaging on that is the biggest key. People pay attention when the when the king sends the message. When IT does, that usually gets brushed aside. You know, I mean, sorry, is what it is, right? Um, raising awareness, um, the best, the the most effective technique in change management is champions program. Hands down. I watch Continental Tire, two hundred and thirty thousand users run their entire change management program with two full-time employees. Two. And they had a network of 1,500 change managers, or uh, champions. But they, did, they got really creative. Every single meeting that was over 30 minutes, the first 30 seconds was these little tidbits. And they would go, it was like three clicks or less. Did you know you could do this in three clicks or less? If somebody would demo. Did you know you could do this in three clicks or less? Did you know here's how you save a here's how you add a file or how you upload a file into the meeting? Click here, click here, click the file, send. Up it goes, right? And people go, ooh, cool. And then you move on. And if you want to see me afterwards, I'll show you how to do it. And that's it. And it, it's like it doesn't take ten minutes into the meeting. It's thirty seconds. And they just all kinds of really cool creative techniques to make it happen. Um, but that was all done through their champions program. So right there, adoption plan checklist. Um, champions community. Yeah, drive awareness for end user engagement. Communicate that value to the business through scenarios. So this isn't about look how many users use the product. Look how many users use the product to do this. This is how they solved this problem. This is how they got this thing done quicker. Um, incorporate success stories, of course. Um, create launch events, yep. And the, all the rest of these are like, yeah, all of the above. Just go do it all. Do anything you can. If you miss one, fine, do the others. If you miss those, do that one. Do something, you know. Um, develop your communication strategy. Sure, build your training strategy. Consider training best best practices, um, you know, and so on and so on. Um, I didn't have much there because you have a strong CSU and you also have your fast track center that has piles of really good organized content that is already now tried and true. It's working, and you should not be doing this from scratch. Period. You should not be doing this from scratch. Um, if you go to successwithteams.com, I think that's what it is. Um, in there is a big library of content that we're constantly adding to, and we're building and building and building and building. All of the little one minute, 30 second videos that are up there now are ones you should be linking to and not necessarily downloading and creating on your own or creating on your own. 
uh, because if we update it, you'll get the update, those things, OK? Um, that's all I'm going to spend on adoption and change management. But again, this is a great big change management exercise. Yes? You've been talking about it all day. <clears throat> as, as a change management practitioner, hmm. I always talk to my, uh, I'm a consultant, so I also I talk to my clients about how a big part of adoption is the actual experience itself. So you can train people, you can communicate to people, but if you don't get the experience right, that counts just as much or more towards or against adoption as anything. So your point about focusing on um, a constant focus on quality going forward and ensuring that the experience improves and gets better is essential to adoption as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it, just for those that sort of are focusing in on this, it's 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 a two side of the equation. It's not just this stuff. It's also the experience. Yeah, th thank you for that. Uh, my my biggest. Uh, we we still have I, I'm one of the I'm not I'm one of very few that's hyper focused on quality and building the platform right. There was a notion that well if you go do all that it's going to delay your rollout of teams, and it's actually not true. It's the other way around. It accelerates it. But there's this notion that um, just go turn it on and it'll work just great. What if it doesn't? Yeah. And then what do they do? They pull back. Uh oh. It's tougher to go a second time and a third time than the first time. Huh? You're on your third. Yep. And you're doing it right this time. It's a disaster. We don't want that. No, we do not want that. So one is to is to help them understand. Two is um, to make sure that we're improving the product to anticipate those problems and fix them before. To actually yeah. you know, put in their ears so they can actually have a better audio experience, right? Absolutely. Doing it that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, even like our MTRs, our, our Microsoft Teams rooms, I can invite this room. Have you guys seen the proximity join with these Teams rooms? It's really cool. I walk into a room with a Microsoft Teams room, no meeting scheduled, no nothing. I take the laptop. Um, the Bluetooth beacon needs to be turned on the Teams room, which by default now it is. Um, I have Bluetooth enabled on my my laptop, and I walk in, put my laptop on the table. I join a meeting that I had scheduled. It says, hey, um, do you want to include the, the, the Teams room? Yeah. So I s click the button, say yes, and then the Teams room rings. I answer the Teams room, and then it knows that I was the one that set the meeting on my end, and so it mutes all the appropriate things on both sides. And so we're in the meeting. The Teams room is the audio and video source or whatever, and the, and the laptop is just the thing that started the meeting. I'm still in the meeting on my laptop, but it's automatically muted. No howling, no nothing. It's that type of intelligence we're building into the products now. You know? So, OK. Yeah, yeah. Um, Right now, uh, proximity join is only done uh, via the desktop client. So if you walk in a room with your mobile device, yeah, it's the same thing but on mobile. So that feature is going to show up in mobile, which is great. It means you only need to bring your laptop in. And I go, I, this is basically my calendar. And I go, oh, is an available room? I walk in. I go, join the meeting. Would you like to join the Teams room to it? Whack, yep. Have a nice day. I'm in. Yeah, it's freaking really cool, you know, um, and does all the same stuff. That's that's what that is. So, uh, well, uh, do you want crawl, walk, or run? Let's start with crawl. <laughs> uh, that is this quarter. This quarter, okay. Yeah, that's been a long time coming. Oh boy, is it complicated. 
And what is the crawl versus walk? I think is somewhere around DLP or something like that. And you know, there are going to be many scenarios in private channels um, where if you're a much more of a secure organization, it is not going to be for you yet till you get to walk or run, you know, and you'll have to decide whether that's something you want to do out of the gates for a smaller subset of people versus another subset based on the limitation that it is. But it's super complicated. Um, because you recently launched the cross posting of channels. I think that along with this makes it very powerful. Yep. But totally agree. Yeah, but we haven't you, seen it yet. Do you want to know what's <laughs> funny about my usage of Teams? Uh, I almost never go into Teams and channels. Almost never. 99% of my day has nothing to do with a team or a channel. I live in Teams all day long. It's my interface. If you start hearing the notion of Teams being the new Windows or the new OS, don't be shocked. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a notion being bandied around banded around right now of like wow what what a cool idea it's like just sticking that in your heads like imagine if yeah <laughs> but we're not gonna we're not going there I'm just saying that it's the idea for me is when I wake up every day and I look at my laptop it's Teams that's the thing I look at but I almost never live in Teams and channels I do I live almost exclusively in chats um, I have contextual chats. I have ones that I've turned into names. So I think we even have one for this event. I'm afraid to open up my, my Teams client in front of a bunch of people, but you know, let's take a few risks, have fun. Let's be embarrassed by something. Um, uh, yeah, multi-customer transition workshop. I'm afraid. No, we're good. This is how I live. I don't even live in chats. I mean, I don't even live in channels and teams. Some of this stuff might translate over to a channel or a team, but most of my work is living on this left side in chats. And you can see all the ones below. They're all for things that I'm working on. You know, the Ignite 2019 session. I'm not doing that within a channel or a team. I'm doing this as in a chat with, with a group of people. And this is how we live. And some of these last forever, like the EU formerly informal chat. Versus one that's going to last until after Ignite, and then we pinch it off and it's gone, right? Um, that's kind of how I live. Um, I only go to teams and channels through my activity feed. This is the only place where I live, actually, in teams and channels. I don't go to them. They come to me. If somebody wants me in a team or a channel to go, to go read something, they at mention me and they let me know and I go in there. Right. This isn't for everybody, but that's how I live. Like again, I rarely click that Teams button. Rarely. So there's too much. I I'm in like a hundred thousand freaking teams, you know, and eight million channels. And like I'm not gonna keep up with all that. So I just when it wants me to know what's important, it'll tell me. Good. So that's it. We're at the beginning of this where there's so few channels still, but I, I'm, I'm starting to understand that when, when you've been in this world for a number of years, just the number of teams and channels that you're a part of is just insane, right? Mm -hmm. right? I see what you're saying. For yeah, sure. yeah, it's it's untenable. And so it's like, well, maybe maybe we should block it. Maybe we should manage it. Maybe we shouldn't allow users to create teams. Maybe we should, maybe we should like ring fence everything. No, let them have it. Mm -hmm. It'll it kind of sort of fixes itself. There are certain guidelines that you're going to build, um, but what we found is most successful is when they kind of let them have at it. Look, you have data loss. You have things you need to be concerned about. You have intellectual property. You need to manage that, and that's fine. I call it transparent guardrails. They don't need to know you're blocking them. Figure out a way to make it that way. You know. Um, because the, the, the early deluge of teams and channels then just started to go away when people realized they were creating teams for the wrong reason. And then they auto archived and they went away and then they got deleted at some point. And this great big huge mass of, of channels and teams were all created, teams and channels, whatever. And then we noticed this, it just levels out. 
and then the old ones start to drop off, and then the company is operating the way it probably should. Kind of fixed itself. You know, I'm not saying that's for every case, but it kind of sort of fixed itself, you know, as people learn how to use it, you know. So um, if someone said, would you, are you better off blocking or enabling all of it? I'd say enable within your corporate boundaries. You know, I respect that. You know? um, okay. So uh, I'm going to. We got through that. OK. Remember this plan? Um, here's what all these mean. We're at 210. I think we're good. Um, here are. Uh, here's an example of those building blocks. You guys saw that one. Way back here, where was it? Da, 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 da. I'll get there. Way back there. Yeah, that one. These ones, right? All these. Most of those are kind of the same thing. Teams only. That's what TO means. Meetings pilot. Uh, TOPOC. Teams only pilot. No EV. Teams only pilot. EV. ACM. Adoption and change management. Um, there's some unique ones like who was concerned about the cost of the uh, of the commercials for uh, for cloud PBX and and conference and conferencing. Yeah, we got to resolve that, right? That doesn't necessarily mean these. Oh, uh oh, now it's freaking out. It doesn't necessarily mean these don't can't get started, but we do have to have this resolved by a certain point, or we're never going to get there. Look at that, the, the fame true up, right? So if I look at these, they're kind of all the same. What, what, we've, what I've found is most of these blocks are the same in every deployment, in every customer. So what I wanted to do is go all the way back to that part and just kind of walk through what each one of these means. And there, remediation. To me, that is the most important and the day zero activity. There isn't a customer on Earth that doesn't need to pay close attention to that green remediation box. Even if things are running really well, like I saw with some of the customers today, they still don't know everything they need to know. So remediation is the idea of gaining visibility first and tuning the network and the firewall and proxy around it figuring out what that tooling looks like so you can know how to go stand up the next three uh, boxes. So remediation always comes a little bit before those next three. Governance is broken into two categories. There's the SharePoint governance kind of thing, and then there's the IT governance thing. So those light blue boxes, I kind of focus more on the IT governance. But sometimes people have a great big pile of SharePoint groups and so on, and they have this real big gnarly structure. And they also need to put in a box around Teams governance, right? How are we going to deploy Teams out to the organization? Are we going to let them create their own Teams, or are we not? And someone needs to go figure that out, OK? Um, but I'm going to focus on this one here. This is IT governance. So who's going to manage it? Yeah, I heard a lot of people say uh, role-based access control today. Yeah, that's where that governance thing fits in right there, is you need to have those conversations. Who's going to have access to it? What type of access are they going to have to, on, uh, to it based on the rules and the options we've given you? Um, IT pro. So. Uh, is that of alignment? No, they should be straight. Um, uh, the IT pro is how are we going to manage it? So is it going to be a bunch of PowerShell? Um, where are all the policies? We have conferencing policies and messaging policies and all these things that we can carve up to make sure the right user gets the right experience. And you need to go through those. And in that box, you're going to settle in on that and figure out 
you know, I would recommend no more than two or three policies, but there may be some reasons why you need a specific policy for perhaps your first line workers. Um, you can customize the mobile experience to be dumbed down and look just like WhatsApp or something else, like really, really simple. And for someone who's just checking stock on a, you know, on a, on a retail floor, they don't need all that extra stuff. They need the basics, right? And you can tune the interface to do that. So within IT Pro, how are you going to manage that? Um, how are you going to make sure that's all going? Uh, and then you get to the help desk part, which is in operations, how are you going to keep the system running? How are you going to handle calls coming in? Um, how are you going to deal with those repeatable tasks that happen all the time? Maybe you could even do something like get plug flow into it and have flow do a bunch of your work for you, right? So figure out ways to automate some of these processes, taking your taking the uh, the responsibility away from those users or the the IT admins. Um, change management, we've been through that. The reason why there's an ACM box and then there's that arrow in some of those is the idea is with change management, you're supposed to go build your book of business, the methodology, the planning that you're going to go do, and then you go execute on that. And in those other plans like like this one, um, change management asks, uh, continues, right? But you went and built what you thought you needed right there. You tested it. And so you see under the POC, that's during the change management, because you may not need much for those POC users. But then before you get to pilot, you kind of have to have that figured out, because you're going to test that that plan up against it, right? So all of these things fall in the right place. Um, communications plan is different than change management. Some people lump those together. Those are different. A communications plan is not a change management plan. It could be a subset, but communications is how are you going to notify users of what's happening, when it's coming, and who's going to do it. And I'm really hoping it is a C-level that's delivering the singular message. Um, I, I, I mentioned that earlier this morning, and then uh, a coworker, uh, I think it was, it was a Dave. Where are you, Dave? He's not here. Um, he said, "Hey, uh, go back around on that one." Or is Andrew? He said, "Go back around on that one." What we see is, if you really want this to go well, it's the top of the food chain that sends out the message on what we're doing, right? The read when I when I brought up Fresenius Medical Care flipping the switch on sixty thousand users. If IT had delivered that message, it would have been one holy hell of a horrid day on October 14th. But it was leadership that sent that message. They didn't have to say much. They said, Teams is our future come October 14th and to other business. <laughs> That's all they had to say. And the phone didn't ring. Yeah. No, I think CIO is great. C level, you know. Hey, go as high as you can, right? Of course. Um, but what I, I and all the respect to the to the um, the directors and the and the you know whatever in the room, um, it really it it needs the person who's creating the strategy for the company not for the tool, but for the company is really where it should come from. You know, who owns your digital workplace transformation initiative at your organization? Who owns that? Who's getting their million dollar bonus? That's who it should come from. Yes. Yeah. If, if it comes from a, sure. another leader that's talking with like a finance person or whatever, somebody who actually sometimes really read their emails, that's kind of hard to 
Yeah, yeah good, good point. Yeah, that, that's right. It's like, look, the message has to be effective, right? Who is the person in the organization that owns that message? And who's it going to be received by? Whose head's going to get chopped if it goes badly, right? Um, if it's not read, if it's not heard. Um, but it doesn't take much. You know, the communications plan is really important, but that the, that singular message, like like for FMC, um, it again, it was one email, and that's all it took. And every and everybody else did all the rest of the work. You know, um, okay, grow teams. Uh, I didn't talk much about this, but there's a reason why there's that triangle on the board. We've been, we were in, oh man, this is being recorded, right? Um, there were a lot, uh, how many of you are familiar with modes? Islands mode, teams only mode, Skype for business, where teams with collab only what, and Skype for business with teams, meetings, collab, and IM, and I don't know. Um, in my mind, there's two modes. There's teams only and there's islands mode. Okay. And there are very unique cases where the other modes that we built are, are important. But to me, those are the two. If you follow this really, really simple bit of advice, it's right there. Grow teams to 100% saturation on islands and flip the switch. If you can do that and you can get everybody touching teams, you can flip the switch in really short order. It's that simple. If you do that, this is going to be a little bumpy. You know, there's the confusion and the coexistence and all that garbage. And that's why you go, Whack. how long do you see it? It's not, it's not even six months. If you can do it, it doesn't matter where you're starting from. You see how Islands was a 16 gay before they decided to do that? Fine. Wherever it is you came from, day one's today, right? Not nine months ago when you started playing with teams. Day one's today. So what's your plan from today on out? That's what you should be thinking about. So great, there's pre-existing conditions, right? And that's why it starts at zero, even though they already had 16K out there. This is a real plan that really happened. Um, they grew teams. They promoted it. They went crazy. They went here. Here's what's happening. And by the way, here's the day we're going to switch. And they did that. So that 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 the, the wedge of the triangle is there because it's saying with only two modes and that plan, you will succeed. I am really confident about that. I'm really confident. We have evidence everywhere. So if you do that, that will go well. If you're using enterprise voice, you have another minor wrinkle to this. If you came from Skype on-prem with, with, with enterprise voice or Skype online with enterprise voice, there is only one real way to get to Teams enterprise voice. That's to go, that user has to go Teams only. So you see down here Teams only POC, EV POC, they're side by side. In here, because you don't turn on EV without going teams only. So what did Black and Beach do? They did it all in 10 weeks. Screw it. Let's go. Worked. Um, that doesn't mean you don't grow, generally speaking, in islands mode. And then when you're ready to start turning teams only, go. Get your pilot, get your IT, get whoever else over into Teams only mode. That's fine. But when you get to the, when you get everyone using Teams, it's time to go. Don't waste any more time. Don't put anyone in Islands mode any longer than they have to. Quicker you get them up to speed, to 100%. Quicker you can flip the switch, and you're there. Um, back to here, meeting rooms. Meeting rooms, meeting rooms, meeting rooms. Um, everybody has a meeting room strategy. You're all coming from somewhere. You're either coming from Polycom group series or a bunch of trios with a Visual Plus codec or, or 
Skype room system V1s or maybe V2s. Um, if you have V2s, maybe you have some Surface hubs or whatever else, um, whatever other endpoints you have out there. You need to assess not only where you're coming from, but where you're going. We've created cloud video interrupt to allow your, your uh, um, those legacy endpoints to connect into, uh, into the Teams meetings. But to be perfectly honest with you, um, you really want to be on Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams rooms, MTRs, because of all the innovation we're doing. So you basically need to track that library of, for whatever you have that's pre-existing, what can you upgrade to work as a Microsoft Teams room? Whatever you have pre-existing that's legacy, you'll use CVI. And ultimately, you're going to track to as many MTRs and Surface Hubs as possible. Um, there'll be a new, uh, um, I did a, a project with Boston Scientific. And it's amazing. They did, they did such a great job. And they focused it primarily on meetings. Um, the only caveat they said was, hey, you know what, Microsoft? For your larger rooms, you kind of stink. So we kind of need to use these Cisco rooms for these for these bigger ones. OK. And they said, we're going to use Cloud Video Interrupt for that to connect into the Teams rooms because it made sense to them. They built their library, and off they went. There is a fast track program, uh, I believe, available to all of you with certain, I don't know, thresholds or whatever. Um, uh, that Microsoft will put in five Teams rooms of varying sizes and shapes into your organization uh, through a partner, an uh, a, a integration partner. Will they come install it all? Zero. As long as when you're done with that, you're committing or you're, 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 you're pinky swearing to Microsoft that you're going to do more of those. I think they want 10 more or something like that. No one's doing no one's doing the inventory, but they're saying we don't just want you to get a bunch of free stuff. We want you to actually use it and make that part of your plan. But we're seeding five of your units, and then we give you the line cards that you put in your catalog. So when you say, "I'm refreshing that room," I'm going to use option B for that room, and it has a puck, and it has a camera, and it has a TV screen that I got from Best Buy, and blah 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 blah. And they help you with that whole catalog, and it's all done. You're done. Um, so I would, it's called, the, I believe it's called the Manage Room. It used to be called the Manage Rooms program. I think it's called the Teams Rooms program or something like that. Manage Team MTR. I don't know. Um, but see your account team, see your fast track um, center, and they will help you get that going. But that's meeting rooms. It's a critical part of the experience. You need to take big, uh, you need to account for it. OK, the next um, two of them are around uh, dial tone. So calling plans and then direct routing. How many of you are doing any direct routing POCs or pilots right now? Anybody? One, two? Oh, you are? OK. That's it. How many of you are planning on doing enterprise voice with Teams? I thought I saw a lot of you in the profiles. I saw. The majority of you are going to do voice. How are you planning on doing voice? Calling plans or direct routing? Oh, I'm sorry. From a from a, um, a calling perspective. Calling plans. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, those aren't necessarily for everybody, right? No. Yeah. Christian, maybe define for this audience because we've got uh, other people are being shy or people are. Um, Sure. Maybe the food is hit after lunch because we've got the blood sugar dip. So, oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Direct routing, folks, is the idea that calling plans are one thing. Microsoft becomes your carrier. You report your number to us, and it rings in Teams. We are your phone bill, your phone system. It's all outsourced to our cloud. A lot of organizations are telling us, that's cool if I don't have anything existing, but I've got the big refrigerator in the corner, and I've got the PRIs that come into that thing, and the PRIs are the big deal because I have a five-year and unbreakable contract with these huge expenses associated with breaking that carrier agreement. So I need the phone numbers to ring where the phone numbers ring. What I need you to do is take that PRI and send it up into your cloud 
to make it ring in teams. That's what direct routing is about. And so the idea then is that you can say, hey, I'm going to take my existing carrier relationship with the phone numbers and the minutes plan that I have today. I'm not going to ask my carrier to relinquish those numbers because they get a little passive aggressive when I do that. Um, I'm going to leave it with the bill that I pay today for PSTN connectivity, the DID, the services, the phone number. And I just need that to ring in my team's client. Can you make that happen, Microsoft? And so that's what direct routing is about. Mm -hmm. It says we're going to do the same thing that every telephony modern provider has been doing for a while. What we're going to do is we're going to take that PRI in and we're going to connect it to a session border controller. That session border controller is going to act like your CSU, DSU for the cloud. If you're an old voice nerd like I am, that makes sense. If that made no sense to you whatsoever, don't worry about it. The idea, though, then is what you're doing is you are taking that call in, you are doing something with it in a box on premises or a box in your carrier's data center, and they are looking to teams to decide what happens to that number next. And you can make that ring down into your team's client, make that ring down into your managed team's room, or ring down into a team's aware desk phone if you still need a hard phone on your desk. I'll go on. Yep. So that's enter our enterprise voice strategy so yeah that falls into two categories calling plans and direct routing and clearly uh, both of those need to be vetted out so calling plans is more of what you talked about because it's so easy to turn them on it's about does it make economic sense and if so there's a number porting process if you're not going to use Microsoft numbers and you need to go testing through that process I have Northeastern University right now that just moved their first hundred numbers and it um, losing carriers aren't uh, inspired to be really nice. And so you have to go through the process to figure out what makes your losing carrier um, okay with losing that business, which means you have to go through the process. And that's why we, we call it out. Um, but the calling plans, it's only one box because once you figure it out, it's just enabling it on a user and it's done. It's a no brainer. Um, but it has to make economic sense too. We charge differently than the per minute model, although there is some of that option. But um, direct routing POC and pilot, fine. Um, o O365 review. Um, that one is how many of you are still on Exchange on prem? There's a handful. And you're doing really well. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But then at the same time, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't even think I need this. We have pockets, but then we still have an Exchange 2003 server, and we have, we have, yeah, yeah mailboxes on prem still. So, my guess is they're just used to old, crusty stuff, and so they're okay with it. We're, yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, I get it. Um, uh, but we know that the best possible user experience is an Exchange Online account because then meeting generation and all those other cool things that come in the way we built the product are accounted for. So that Office 365 review could be, we have a really long plan to get to Office 365. How many of you have barely even started your path to Office 365? I thought I saw one or two customers. Um, I looked at the telemetry and I showed there were a couple that had, it was like thousands of users as an employees and like 20 users in Office 365. I thought I saw one or two of those companies where they barely even begun their trip to Office 365. Well, okay, um, we need to take that into account to decide what you're going to do next. Um, some people are using Teams as the very first workload to go. Well, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Um, I would recommend that actually Exchange is the first to go and that Teams should go right alongside it. If you do those two, you'll do pretty well. You don't have to move your SharePoint, things like that. Um, you just have to enable your SharePoint online. Um, OK, and then the last um, island, so the little arrow is basically saying, where were you? Where are you going? Um, where, what's, our, what's our starting point? Everyone's coming from a different place. Um, so almost every customer that I've spoken to has turned on Teams in some respect whether it's 100 users or, or their entire org. Um, and then below the Teams client, you'll notice in all of these, get the Teams client out there. 
They're going to take three months to get it out there for 60,000 users. Um, smaller companies can get it out much quicker than that. Um, I, again, I've had some customers roll out the Teams client to 60, 80,000 users in two weekends. They just went, go. It's out there. We're done. Check. Um, Christian, it's probably yes. worth mentioning that every single one of those customers that did that generally started out thinking it was going to take them two to three years because they were rooted in the oh. old three-year change management. Oh, my new version of Office, I just paid for oh. it last year. So now I'm going to take them the next three years to roll it out just in time to get the new version in the mail. There were only, I, th I think I saw 80-something customers in, in 12 to 18 months, and I could count on my hand how many um, wanted to go faster than we thought they should. There's a consistent story arc here, which is every organization starts out with the, hey, it's just another version of Office. We'll take three years to roll it out. And then yeah. they say, this is an IT tech project. When my SCCM package is done, just try and keep the help desk volume down. And then they start realizing, we're asking people to change the way they work. If you've done a good job of reaching out to them and finding how they work and then fitting teams to that, there's a transitional phase change in the middle of that project where executives start asking, this is great. How do we make this go faster? How do we do this in fewer steps? How do we remove complexity from the process? And so most of them that do it very aggressively get it down to two to four big hunks. And they do all of the pre-work front-loaded in exactly the same way that Christian's been talking about. Focus on what the end user needs, what's in it for me, focus on quality early. And then the project, you start having the business ask you to compress the timeline for it. But yeah. everybody has exactly the same objection. Oh my gosh, you want me to do what? For how many people? By when? No can do. Sorry about that. Yeah. And so starting the journey, there's an initial hip hitch you got to get over there. But once you get far enough in, if you do what we're telling you, inevitably the business starts running to you. Hey, how do we yeah. get this faster? How do I move my senior executive? How do I move my critical work group? How do I get this group of that's made of high performance folks that we're onboarding? How do we get them on first? Because everybody wants to be associated with the success. Yep. Nobody wants to be last to go, except the laggards and they'll, uh, they'll always be like that. Um, the, the, the last one, uh, the last four there, the Teams Only POC, we talked about those. We talked about Teams Only. It's the bottom one that I, I want to spend a little bit more time on. Um, how many of you have contact centers in your organization? Every hand should go up, right? Of course. How many contact centers do we have working for Teams right now? That's a zero. Should you wait? Yeah. How many of you have elements of compliance call recording that you need to have within your organization? Anybody here? No? A few? OK. Yep. There's always going to be some. What's that? OK. Yeah. And so uh, I want to spend a little time on that. Um, and then there's the tenant consoles. But that's probably when it comes to enterprise voice, that's the number one request. Will it work with NICE? Will it work with Genesis? Will it work with Anywhere 365? When, 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 when? Um, so the answer is um, we've been building APIs. Those APIs have gone out to a select set of our content, uh, our contact center compliance call recording partners. The APIs are continually being built, uh, uh, developed in TAP with those partners. Um, you are going to see announcements at Ignite around the availability um, of contact centers natively integrated into Teams. Um, Let's just say very soon. Um, I would hate to spoil the fun of the of the Ignite conference, but it's good news. It's good news. So remember crawl, walk, run. You are likely to have a feature or a, uh, a function in one of your contact centers that you don't. That's not going to be there yet in the API, but we'll be working on it furiously. 
So we're getting that out the door. And if I were to give you a safe statement, you should expect Q1 of next year to be a field day for contact centers and opportunities to move your users for contact center. Um, what are the contact centers? What are the brand names that you're using right now? Is it like old school Cisco and Avaya and Genesis or what? Anybody? Cisco Contact Center, okay, not a problem. Here's the thing, what I, what we always ground out on is it can wait. Um, see that down on the bottom right hand side? That's a real customer saying, I'm not gonna rely on Christian telling me Q1 because I don't really care. I'm just gonna get everything else done and I'm gonna worry about that when it comes. Now, the only ones that put us under a little bit of pressure, they say, hey, I have to renew my Cisco contract in March, and I'm under pressure because they want another big, fat, gnarly deal. And if I don't tell them that by the end of March, they can go pound sand, then I have to renew. And I agree, it's a challenge. Um, all I would tell you is, uh, we're working on it. It's it's the most commonly asked advanced feature, and the APIs are really close. They're really close. So we're doing well. Um, don't sign any big long contracts. <laughs> Go month to month if you can, because <laughs> it'll be worth it. All right, um, because then everything's living in that same ecosystem. Um, but that's really the idea around Teams Advanced Enterprise uh, Advanced uh, Features. Any other features in telephony that you feel like you're missing that you'd like to know about? Because I, I mentioned call, compliance contact recording, compliance call recording, contact center, attendant console. There's a handful of them out there that are that we're getting really close on. For you, uh, um, nerds, the, the one of the biggest challenges we had was actually building our presence, our new presence engine, to be down to like the second or millisecond level. Like, by the way, we had in Skype. And then we delivered it in Teams up to four minutes lag. That was a small problem. Imagine a contact center having to use four minute buffer to see if you're available or not. It doesn't work out so well. So we had to go, that's the thing we kind of sort of had to go build. We had to build the APIs, but we also had to build the machine to work that way. Christian, while yes. the room is mulling that question, um, uh, show of hands again for the folks. I'm just going to try this by acclaim rather than asking folks directly. So show of hands of people who have contact centers in your environment again. All of you. You know it. Okay, so that, that's a much more rational answer. That's what I was expecting. I, I, I built contact centers for 20 years, so that's more what I expected. Okay, so the same folks that just raised their hands a, a moment ago, in your next major refresh of that technology, are you looking to refresh that with more on-premises infrastructure? Hands up, if that's the case. Okay, how many of you are looking then, same group, everybody else is just watching, um, looking to replace that with online properties, lighter weight cloud services? How many of you didn't raise your hand in either case? So it's a, is that a, we don't know? So you don't know which way you're going? You're still investigating yeah. that? Okay. I'm sorry? You're doing it. Okay, and that was the answer I was looking for. So a lot of organizations are telling in us contact, contact centers yeah. are the most expensive workload you can possibly buy for anyone, anywhere, any with any time in the enterprise. Um, they cost me between $1,200 to $1,800 a seat just to start, a third of that in maintenance every year. They are large beasts that are tied to KPIs. They are a big rock to move. That's one of the reasons that we're not rushing to go fill that need because we understand Rome is not built in a day. You spend a 10 years moving into that thing. But at the same time, it's also probably one of the largest ROIs for the enterprise. If you're going to have a contact center and it's going to do customer-facing business, it's a really big cost sink if you're not doing it right. And so a lot of organizations are saying, 
what's the lightweight version of this that I can replace it with? And more and more customers are saying, this wants to be a SaaS cloud service because I have well-known, well-understood, well-defined job roles that are transparent and swappable. When people go on and off shift, they, I want them to just go to a web page, sign in, and then the thing they're in front of rings when they're on shift. They do their work, they sign out, zero residual touch or low residual touch. So the model for contact centers is changing in a lot of cases. And the good news is it's changing towards a SaaS footing. And that's what we're aiming at with Microsoft Teams. So we're not going to try and replace a box on-prem for your box on-prem. We are, very, however, very interested in doing things in the cloud to help customers with that very expensive workload do it better, faster, and probably more cheaply. So watch this space. Nothing to communicate today. We don't want to step on our executives' announcements later. but. Useful. So, Makes Christian, really you were asking any other voice, uh, any other voice features that are people have uh, have qualms about? Yeah. Before we move on, what do you mean? Oh yeah, that's already Azure. Uh, you mean voicemail? Yeah, Azure voicemail is already there. We already do. Yeah, yeah, that's already there. If if you've tested enterprise voice in Teams, you'd see that. Already, Chris, we turn, turn down Exchange UM, moved it over to Azure Voicemail. So, uh, any other any other features or functions or workloads that we've missed today that you wanted to talk about? Yeah. I have a simple question. Okay. Do you know is there anything on the roadmap for being able to change the conversation style? Oh. One of the complaints I heard was um, was without having the choice that uh, being used to Skype, it was just a bit quiet as far as the notification. So simple question, I guess. I'm searching through my brain right now for we have these things called uh, uh, LT review decks. And basically it's what we report up to our leadership, our team's leadership, um, what's coming. And what we're thinking about, you know, things like pixie dust categories that are like, wouldn't it be cool? You know? um, and I don't know if I've seen notification sounds being able to select. It's it's been an ask. I, yeah. I haven't seen it on a roadmap. I haven't seen it on a roadmap. I've, I've had customers asking for it. Yeah, you're not alone. Down, oh, down to relevant the things answers? of just a different. Different sounds for different channels or channel notifications or CCAT notifications. There are there are customer workloads where they want some more granularity where they can get an audible cue about what kind of a notification they use. I think though um, something that is on the roadmap in the very near term is just simply secondary ringer. Um, one of the things that comes up in a lot of cases is customers have been telling us, hey, I've got this headset, but I don't always have it on. Sometimes I put it in the charger, sometimes I set it down, sometimes you know I forget I'm wearing it and I set it down somewhere. My desk rings and the headset's not on my ears. How do I know my desk is ringing? If I'm looking at it, great. But can you make my PC ring, but then the audio flip over to my headset once I actually pick up? So yep. secondary ring coming for the PC is on the very near term roadmap. So that should help if it's just volume and quietude. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Or on the same road map, uh, the screen pop. So, I, as, like, so for example, like right now, if I miss the Skype notification in the bottom right corner with someone's face saying they Skype me, it'll eventually pop up the whole screen, the whole Skype text or the, the chat box pop up on my screen. Right now, the chat, if I miss that bottom right box, I might have a chat. No, hey, probably this. We have a whole notifications team that that's what they do for a living. What you'll find, I forgot what, what it calls it, notifications and chats. Um, what, what you're going to find is there's a million of those little micro features that we are working on that we are releasing that will just start showing up. 
um, while they have they maintain a detailed list, you are unlikely to see a list that gets that granular for you. Um, what I would recommend is there's a thing called user voice. Do you know how to get to that? You do? Yeah, user voice, uh, just just FYI, uh, user voice is a thing. Uh, do you know the URL? Is it? Yeah, go find out. It's really, really, it's important. More importantly, it's in the lower left hand corner of your Teams client underneath the question mark. If you click that, there's a report a problem or suggest a feature. Suggest a feature takes you to the appropriate user voice. The user user voice. Yeah. So actually, don't remember the URL. Forget we said that. Um, go to your Teams. Know file. where to navigate to. The muscle memory is lower left hand corner question mark. Suggest a feature. There you go. It'll pop you to the appropriate user voice. Um, you're going to see a different user voice because as Microsoft employees, we go to an internal user voice, but it just redirects to a URL and it'll take you off to the right forum there. So. Um, so that gets asked a lot. There's a strong discussion going on. We put that politely on uh, question marks not going to change anytime soon. The question mark's got to be recognizable and it's got to be in a spot that people have a muscle memory for. So at the moment, adding our own custom. Oh, we, okay. So here's a couple of recommendations instead. Okay. Um, one, just to finish that off, user voice. I wanted to finish that point. Engineering looks directly at user voice to prioritize features. It's one of the few mechanisms we use. Um, one is because Satya said so. Um, but uh, yeah, joking aside, the um, uh, user voice is the main mechanism engineering uses to prioritize features based on popularity and importance and impact. Okay, so um, what that means is it's not falling on deaf ears. If you plus one a user voice line item a request it has impact okay um to your other point um we have app setup policies and app permissions policies that allow you to customize the left hand toolbar and also the mobile device the buttons across the bottom under what people see by default and there are only a couple that you can't change, and one of them is the question mark. But what I find is very popular, getting away from the speaker, um, is people will create uh, for this bank out of Spain, me 365, MI, right? And it's an icon, they put it on the left-hand toolbar, and it goes to a SharePoint site that looks as if it's integrated into the Teams client and they click on that icon, and that's where all of their help is. And so then you can put all the links you want to anything that you think is relevant, including training material and so on, within that whole ecosystem instead. So while we don't turn that off, you can turn that on right above it. And yeah, and it, that's been the most valuable tool. Creating apps and bots and those types of things from within that like that, Super simple, really straightforward. So um, yeah, that's that's my answer to that. Other than trying to uh, add to that or tear it apart. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Yeah. Will the Office 365 app launcher you see in the browser from to the Teams client? And the reason I ask this is there's that organizational support link that you can customize by clicking the question mark. Will the Office 365 app launcher I'm more, I guess, getting at just some general consistency between the web Office 365 clients and then the Teams desktop client, where the links can be the same within there. I wish I had a prize. You stumped the nerd. Um, I have no idea. I don't have a clue. Hmm. Oh, Man, I don't know. Fair yeah, sorry. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, question. So I know uh, thus far by design, Teams is designed to stay within itself. For instance, Skype is able to dial out from itself into other services. Is there any plans at all to allow Teams out of itself to dial other meeting solutions? So 
you know, we have 30 or 40 Cisco rooms okay. in our environment. I have um, we have integration one word for you for that to get in. One word for you. Sure. Ignite. Next question. Yeah. Just like I can say, hey, all teams owners, this is going on. Or like if our security policies change, like you can't put high confidential data in here anymore. Some way as opposed to going through like a graph API or something that's just like, hey, mm -hmm. all active teams users as opposed to we have all 16,000 users licensed are in, in our environment, but only like 400 use it. Yeah. So you mentioned the keyword graph API, right? What have you seen inside of there? I have seen nothing in there because I haven't gone there yet. Okay. So all of that goodness lives within Graph API. The specifics of that goodness is, again, a crawl, walk, run. Right. So I do not recall if you have the ability to say, to message out through Graph all team's owners, but Graph is really rich. Um, that's where all of your answers are for that. Um, that's where all of our customers do provisioning, auto creation of teams and channels and so on um, based on like we don't do like dynamic team registration stuff, but they do it all through graph. We have, for example, airline an, an airline that every single uh, uh, every shift, every plane that goes off the ground gets its own team spun up with its own channels, with all the same channels. And those flight attendants and pilots and so on that are on that flight are the ones that get automatically created based on the schedule. And that team and those channels and those users are all put in there and they can put them in as owners and as regular users and so on. So do I have the ability to identify an owner versus a user? Yes. So would I should I have the ability through Graph API and Flow to be able to do that automatically? I would think yes. Have I tried it? No, but I already have that granular control. I don't know why I wouldn't be able to pull that off. That's a really good question, though. Christian, there's also potentially another answer to that one. Um, uh -oh. So are you looking to get owners of teams? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I have seen done is um, max team size is 5,000. That's going to go up over time. But 16,000 users, I'm not going to put 16,000 users in one team because I can't. Um, something you could do is there's a concept of a team based off of a dynamic security group. You've seen those in a 365. One of the things you could think about doing is when somebody is flagged as an owner of a team, either by creation, by running a script to find out who owns teams, or by going through a formal team creation process, adjust to taste. One of the things that you might do is you might have an internal team called Teams Owners Forum. Um, this has two benefits. One, remember we keep talking about change champions? Teams owners are gonna be strongly correlated with change champions. Generally, you're gonna have a champions community anyway. If you wanna include those in that champion community, that's your natural audience for messaging this to. The other thing might very well be, just as part of a, um, part of a maintenance function, if you own a team, we're going to add you to team owners, and that's where we tell just team owners things they need to know about managing their assets. That gives me a natural forum then to do things like, hey, ensure your teams are in compliance, or hey, we're rolling out um, time and date based or usage based expiration of teams. You need to know about it. That would be a natural place then to say, I'm going to send an announcement into that team. And so those folks who are team owners could hear that. And so what you'd wind up doing is in 0365, you'd create a team's owners group. You would add people to that when you detect that they are a team owner. And then they would automatically get added to that team's owner's team where you can then naturally message to them. That would be an easy way you can solve it with tools today that are under your control. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Okay. Cool. Any other questions on that? Um, here, yeah. Here goes. Is there a I'm best nervous. practice to manage the number of teams? Because uh, like you alluded to, there's a severe concern that, you know, teams might implode 
as we open it up to the user, then users log in and they see 200 teams on the left hand side, and then they get intimidated and they it, yeah. it drives down the adoption completely. Mm -hmm. So, okay. what are the? I know there is some some uh, capability to do the group expiration. Yep. So when you create a team, but that requires AD premium and all those things. Okay. So what are the other best practices that you have, or maybe a document which allows you to manage those teams effectively? Okay, there's a, there's a few things. Um, one, what I would highly recommend is you going to grab the Office 365. Why do I keep forgetting that? This thing, hold on. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, the Teams Adoption Pack. It is this one. I would highly recommend you go here. Oh, that's not, not quite the link. Um, yeah, the one you're looking for, Christian, is called the O365 Adoption Pack because part of what it does is all of O365, just not Teams. Yeah. So there is the Office 365 Adoption Pack for Power BI, and uh, it has very rich reporting in it, including team usage and so on. What I would highly recommend is you go do and down, you go download that and take a look at what's in there and you were likely to see everything that you're looking for. Um, it's pretty cool. Now, there's also one um, by who? Uh, Tom um, at Modality. There is this There is this other Modality tool. Tom Arbuthnot. Yeah, Arbuthnot, right, right, right. Tom Modality um, Teams Adoption. And they did this very cool, uh, uh, is it Teams Accelerator? I can't remember, but they made this, they, they did this pretty cool product. It costs money, it's something they're trying to sell, but if you want nerd level propeller spinning information about your Teams usage, it's pretty amazing. Um, Take a look, but I would recommend you start with the Office 365 adoption pack for Power BI first. That will tell you one whole heck of a lot. But what I would recommend on top of that, like I mentioned before, is the etiquette guide from, from Matt Wade, uh, and that you uh, let them use it, let your users have at it. By one default, of the critical things here is IT organizations that over frictionalize this, um, hey, my users might, they might go bananas. They might actually use it. Well, so first off, one of the key questions is, wait, where's the victim in this? Um, so I've given my users a tool. They're using the heck out of it. They're experimenting with finding things that work for their audience, for their environment. This is all upside. Um, the cost of storage is minuscule in comparison to the amount of benefit they're going to get out of that. So there's an experiment and try things phase that you don't want to short circuit by quenching it off too early. Mm -hmm. Some of that, frankly, is not going to pan out. They're going to try something. They're going to spin up 16 teams. One of them is going to catch fire. Everybody else is going to want to be where the action is happening. They'll naturally work there. The other ones will go fallow. This is where expiration dates on teams help. Every six months, somebody has to click the button, hey, this team still matters to me. Keep it around. Fail to click the button, goes into soft delete for 30 days, hard delete after 60, team is gone, expiration is out, you're missing on the left-hand side. The other thing that uh, is really interesting is we tend to tell our own story, and at Microsoft, obviously, we are all in with teams. The organizational anthropology, though, that we see with most customers when they are less than two years into the journey is most customers have one to five to seven teams that they're active in. That's a very manageable, small list of stuff, and you can pin content, pin teams, and pin channels. And so you don't want to over-rotate or over-index on what you see in Christian, who's been using teams since it was a glimmer in its daddy's eye and is on 200 teams. He's not representative. The experiment you're going to have is probably much more well-contained and much smaller. 
And so let your users, you know, kind of get out of their way and allow them to experiment. Because one of the other things that's super, super helpful that was on Christian's slide was catch your users doing awesome. Tell the rest of the organization about what's working. People very naturally gravitate towards making their lives and their jobs better. And so find out what's working for your users. You're probably going to discover something we haven't before. Be aware of that emphasize it, and then what you can do is you can snapshot that team as a template, and you can treat that as a rubber stamp for other teams that are gonna create the same thing. So um, there's going to be some early experimentation, let it happen. It'll, it'll naturally cohere into groups that work well together. Um, but there's gonna be some wasted teams early on, no big thing, um, get over that. Right there, yeah, it's not, that's, that doesn't apply to every customer. You know, there's governance rules for certain customers that they can't do that, and that's fine. We respect that. But if you start that out of the gates by default, like that's what you'll challenge the organization with, you're better off. Hey, uh, pa pause for one second. One, one second. Um, oh, no. Uh, if it's on that topic, please. Yeah, yeah. Please. Because I think you're right. Um, the governance piece is important. This is just from a CSM perspective. So at the very least, you don't want to get too far down the road with some of the items around governance and then have to go back and change things. We have a nice governance checklist mm -hmm. online. Walk yourself through that. Make sure you've considered all the items on that list. It's a, it'll take you an hour to go through all of it and think about it. Once you've thought about those and have definitive answers on where you sit, you're in a really good position then let people go play because you'll know do i want naming conventions do i want retention policy all that you'll, you'll at least have an idea and if you're you're i'm okay let's go then you're good to go that's how you can qualify it great thank you um i wanted to do a quick time check because i don't think today we're going to get to building matt's plan um because it's going to take more than a half an hour and I wanted to give it an hour, but I didn't want this. I didn't want this exchange to stop because these things are important for everybody to hear. Um, so what I there's a couple of things I want to offer. One, we have some time. There's snacks and food outside. Um, I'm not going anywhere for another 25 minutes. Then I got to pack it up and go to the airport. Um, we can. For another 25 minutes, we can just keep the Q&A coming and answer anything you want. Um, but what I want to offer also on the on the back end of this is if anybody has a plan, I'm going to send you, we're going to send out these decks and the content that I had in here. And I use this one as a template all the time. Um, Like these, I have, you know, five or six of these in a library that I sterilized and took the customer name off of. And what I would normally do is I would take an hour with somebody at the end of our of our workshop day, and we would just draw this out, right, for each one of you. We can't do 23 of them. We don't even have time for one today. Um, but what I would recommend is I can get these off to you, and you guys can play with these yourselves to figure out what, you know, how to get your plan. And I would be thrilled to check your work on what you want to do um, and compare it up against what I've seen, you know, that's been successful. So you walk away from here and you say, I'm, I'm thinking about what my plan should look like and when I want to get there. And um, I would be super happy with connecting with any one of you and say, let's, let's go over your plan together and let's see if it's valid or if it can go quicker and why, and then you go back to your corner, you say, nope, it's my business. I do what I want. I got to support you, right? But um, I would be super happy to do that. Um, and I know some of you have CSU um, and uh, you've got Fast Track and so on, and they also do this low and mid touch thing to help you get there. But um, that'd be my offer to you guys, anyone who wants that. So that said, I would like to think that the, the, out, the output or the outcome of this session 
is that you can go back and you can write your own plan. You might already have one, and at that point, you should go back and validate that plan and see what you can do to go maybe quicker. Um, does that make sense? So we'll get you this content. Um, I assume the next couple of days before the end of the week, this should go out. It's pretty, pretty easy. I don't know why not. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll compile all the URLs. I kept them all as well. So we'll make a page full of URLs of all the places that we went to. Um, all these templates will be in there and all the content that I shared today, all of this, um, it's all yours. And then um, there are a few of these, like this change management one, uh, like this one. This is all complements of the CSU anyway, but it's about 80 slides. So in every one of these categories, if there's any additional content you want that we didn't provide you, ask for it. And we'll help you get there. OK. The intended outcome of today is that you walk away with the idea of what a plan should look like. And that also that you focus really hard on what I think is important, which is an obsession to quality. And that you get out front of that as quickly as you can. Um, we're working on. A uh, on that quality gauntlet thing that I drew up there. I think it was. Um, this one. And we're um, in, we're in incubation right now with a handful of customers to get this as a more of a formula that we're then going to share out with partners in the Fast Track Center that they can run this. Um, but in the meantime, um, we can share this with you and you can start ticking off those boxes and do it yourself. Make sense? Again, if you focus on quality, you do everything in context of a plan. You think about coexistence being as short as possible. Islands mode to teams only. High mobile adoption. Change management through the roof. Um, everyone gets teams. The advanced workloads can come over time. And you can take your time with them. You'll do really well and you're going to move quicker than you think. We have living proof left and right. <laughs> you move quicker than you think. So what you're probably going to find the most is that when you've moved a big batch of users, the phone didn't ring the next morning at all. And that should give you confidence to move quicker. You should be leveraging your account team for better confidence in roadmap features and so on. And for some of you that are uh, connected directly into engineering, you should be asking for help. That's what we get paid to do. Um, teams engineering, our customer, I work in what's called CLS, Customer Lifecycle Services. Our job is to take care of our customers. So uh, we're, all, we're all there to do that. Um, and that you leverage us. And if you do, you guys are going to do fine. Um, yeah. Never in a day. Consider it gone. <laughs> you still have you still have P chat out there, really. Um, you know what, in, in all honesty, I, I, I want to say I saw something somewhere that said we were going to do some little utility to do it. In fact, that was a, that was a Bernier thing. Yep. And I don't know where he went with that. I haven't heard anything about it in a while. Um, if you ping me after class, um, I could put you in touch with the guy that was playing with that. And if that's something that's important to you, I'll put you over to, to Brandon. His name is Brandon Bernier, Bernier, Bernier. He goes by the American pronunciation. Um, he's super smart. 
Um, so he was playing with that and also doing um, Slack to Teams migration utilities and some other cool stuff, looking at data on both sides and figuring out how to get it there. And that was one of them. So yeah, ping me, um, you saw my name, um, cburke at microsoft.com. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll connect the dots. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions?